We're going to go ahead and uh, provide a brief overview of YesSF. Um, this was an initiative that started three years ago in partnership with the World Economic Forum, uh, Uplink out of the World Economic Forum, Salesforce, Deloitte, and City. Uh, so three years ago, they came together to um, develop these urban sustainability challenges to try to pair eco-entrepreneurs with venture uh, capitalists, as well as marketing professionals to try to amplify the work of these startups um, and help us solve our, our climate crisis. And then about a year, year and a half ago, um, came together at Dreamforce and included the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce um, hyper-locally here um, to try to do a place-based challenge uh, to two prong, two goals to try to uh, help San Francisco reach our climate action plan goals, but then also at the same time, try to um, revitalize our, our city and our, our downtown. So those are kind of the, the main goals. And here on the screen, you can see some of our partners. Uh, next slide, please. Let's see. I wanna see if my colleague is here. Oh, wonderful, let's see. I am going to- Hi, Emily, I'm online. Hi, everyone. Great, and here's my colleague, Sharon, who is the SSF lead at the forum, who can share some more context. Introduce myself, I'm Sharon Lai, and I represent uh, the World Economic Forum, who has been leading this uh, really cool first uh, of its kind place-based innovation challenge as a effort is really to try to bring um, sustainability technology into San Francisco as part of our economic recovery efforts uh, within downtown. Um, so without further ado, we're going to bring on our very first innovator. Uh, you all should have uh, received a booklet this morning uh, with some uh, basic information about the innovators. Uh, Emily will be uh, explain our format today, uh, but basically we are giving each of the innovators a couple minutes to uh, share their product and, and their um, what they're really trying to achieve here. And then we will open it up for uh, question and answers um, after each uh, presenters um, uh, is done with their with their slides and uh, innovators. Just as a reminder, you are enabled to uh, share your screen, and you will be in charge of managing that. Okay. If anyone else has questions, please go ahead and put them into the chat during the presentation. We will be collecting them and um, directing the questions during the Q and A portion. Thanks, Emily. Great, thanks, Sharon. I'll go ahead and run through uh, the agenda really quickly before we bring up our top innovators. Um, so let's see, next screen here. All right, so we broke up the top innovators into three different categories. We've got energy, water and waste management and soil and greening. So we'll take each of these in those categories. Each innovator will have about five minutes to provide an overview of their product uh, and then five around five minutes um, for some Q&A. So again, if you have a question for the top innovator, please uh, put that in the Q&A box um, and do uh, accept my apologies if I have to try to cut anyone off to keep us on time. We have uh, 14 great innovators and I wanna give them each ample time to give their presentations. Um, and then we'll go ahead around 3.15, do some general questions if you have any um, questions for the innovators, but also around YesSF, and we can share a bit more about what that initiative is and uh, all the other ways to, to get in, uh, involved. And then we'll we'll wrap. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring um, Tia from It's Electric up. So you are being promoted now and should have the ability to share your screen and video. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me and see me? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. I'm going to share my screen. It's great to be presenting to everyone today. My name is Tia Gordon. I am the co-founder of It's Electric, and we are specifically solving a problem of electric vehicle charging for cities. Uh, on a macro scale, um, we need 1 million more public level two chargers in the United States. And then to put it on a micro or city-based scale here in, and, and, and nationally we have around 100,000. And then to put it on a micro scale in New York City, where I'm calling you from, we currently have 100 charges. We need to go to 10,000. So we're 10 xing on that micro and that macro view. So how do we do this in a way that is sustainable? And this is what we're solving for cities like New York, cities like San Francisco, cities like DC, cities like Boston. 
Uh, in the world of electric vehicle charging, as many of you know, there's sort of three categories. There's home charging, which is how 85% or so of people will charge their vehicles. They'll just basically go home at the end of the day, plug in their car, and then be done with it. There's fast charging on highways or rest stops, um, and that's very well attended to from Tesla and Electrify America. And then there's this third or final frontier of urban charging, and this is specifically what we're solving. We are the world's first public charging system that does not connect to the utility. We are powered by buildings. We erect a charger on public right of way or on the sidewalk, and we pull the power for that charger from the spare capacity of the adjacent building. This allows us to stand a charger up in just two days once we have permission from the city to deploy. So our first step is to get to receive that city's permission, and then we build partnerships with property managers, with architects, uh, with developers, and with everything in between that are looking for design-centered approaches to electric vehicle charging, uh, where they might be previously limited, limited in ways in terms of finance, in terms of space, and we can help solve that all with this public charging solution. Buildings are also eager to work with us because we are free. There is no hardware cost, there is no installation cost, and we revenue share back to that building. So that building is earning passive income every month just by letting us take up this little eight inch by eight inch square on its curbside, providing an amenity to its tenants and helping at the larger sense us um, meet ESG goals. We've proven our technology here in Brooklyn. We ran a pilot last year with Hyundai, the New York City Economic Development Corporation, uh, and we've now started to deploy nationwide. The value proposition, like I mentioned earlier, is that because we're behind the meter, we're not connecting to the utility, we truly can deploy without discrimination. We're not limited to where we can install our chargers by the capacity of the, of, of the utility connection. So often that's the case with every other company out there that's currently trying to deploy in cities. They're really at the, they're beholden to the utility to tell them where and where they cannot make those connections where there is capacity or where there's just too many grid connections and they can't bear additional ones in that specific neighborhood or uh, area that's off of that substation. We're also the first company to offer a detachable cable. And the detachable cable is really important because the cable, when it's attached, is the first component that breaks on a public charger. It's also not something that's really sightly. People don't want really uh, a piece of hardware that looks like a pump on their residential tree line block or on their sort of, you know, very well groomed commercial corridor. So what we do instead is we give drivers the cables. This is stopgap, we know that the cables are gonna to start to come with the vehicles in the next few years. And this is now a standard um, from the Society of Automotive Engineers. Um, we give everyone the right cable for their vehicles so we can assure ourselves of interoperability. We've earned recognition along the way, in addition to being uh, yes, SF, uh top innovator, We've also won Fast Company's next big thing in tech, and we are part of the White House EV Acceleration Challenge, among other accolades. The opportunity that we're seeking is to find properties in San Francisco where we can deploy chargers as part of our YesSF pilot. Um, we really need nothing more than the cooperation of that actual property manager. And then we have a one-day inspection and a two-day installation. I'm also listing other cities that we're working in, in case anyone that's listening that's coming from real estate, coming from construction, coming from architecture, wants to see this across other properties within their portfolio as well. So San Francisco is our target. It's the purpose. It's why we're all here on this call today. But we can also talk to you about Boston, D.C., L.A., Detroit, Alexandria, Jersey City, and New York. As an example of the type of revenue that the building can earn from working in partnership with its electric, is going to be based on the utilization of the charger and the amount of chargers we deploy in front of each building. So we can go anywhere from $4,000 a year up to $17,000 a year. In cities like San Francisco, where we're looking to bring economic recovery, especially to downtown areas where there's lower uh, rates of, occup of occupancy right now following the pandemic, this is a great way for buildings to start to earn back some of that revenue while providing a public amenity that's a sustainability goal for the city. All of our installations then give a live dashboard to our host properties. You're able to see utilization rates. You're able to see charging data. You're able to see the aggregate of this information. 
production as well as carbon reduction impact. So this is really important as well for additional streams of income for these property owners when they're trying to meet these goals and these carbon offsets. As I mentioned earlier, our installation is based is two days. It's modular like a Lego. Day one is subgrade. Day two, we pop the top on. If a charger goes down, there's no on-street diagnostics. We literally come in, remove the top, pop on the new unit, and walk away. Uh, just some general sort of urban planning sort of nerd moments here. Um, we really have very a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of siting. Um, I hope this deck will be shared with the groups that are on this call today, so you can kind of dig a little bit more into this. But really, um, we're looking to deploy on both sides of one-way streets for accessibility. Uh, we want to make sure that we're near commercial corridors for daytime charging opportunity, as well as that overnight charging that we're trying to encourage in residential areas. And we just want to make sure that we're offset from trees, utility hardware, hydrants, and other street furniture. Ideally, we're also located near there's pedestrian ramps for ADA accessibility. My name is Tia. It's been a pleasure to present to you and please reach out for me, uh, reach out for any additional questions you might have, or if you'd like to be one of our locations for San Francisco, I'd love to talk with you. Great. Thank you, Tia. Um, please do uh, enter questions in the chat if you have any. Uh, I'm going to kick us off with the first one here. Tia, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what is the ideal a uh, phase of a project that your technology would be used and if that matters at all. Uh, so for example, how would your product uh, integration look if it's a new construction project versus uh, a building that is of course already there? Yeah, we are designed to be installed in the existing built environment. So that's our sweet spot, but we can also be part of long-term planning for new construction where the conduit is pre-laid before the sidewalk, sidewalk is poured. So that avoids the sort of, you know, two-day installation process that we would have to do. That j box would be pre-installed. It's a very simple procedure. We have full documentation. Uh, we would introduce your team to our civil engineers and we'd be able to integrate that into your early design documentation. So in an ideal world, uh, you get uh, a big order um, from uh, one of our uh, awesome attendees here, and let's say they uh, want to order a thousand of these. Um, what is your production turnaround like right now? What's your capacity limits? Tell us a little bit about uh, where your factory and all of the logistics are located. Absolutely. So we are Buy America, Build America. We do this to meet the provisions of the Biden administration and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. So we produce in, right now we're producing in Connecticut and also we're expanding our um, uh, fabrication to Detroit and to Los Angeles. As of right now, we're able to produce 5,000 units per month. Um, various cities have different goals in terms of the number of electric vehicle chargers are looking to deploy. Um, but we're talking about every city that we're in touch with is looking for chargers on par of thousands, if not tens of thousands, to meet the demand that they anticipate. Just a quick stat on that, right now in the United States, there's 3 million EVs on the road. And by 2030, we're anticipating 37 to 45 million EVs to be on the road, of which a portion of those, a significant portion of those, will require public charging because they do park on street. Great. And there is a question in the chat very quickly if we can have just one minute um are you still looking for uh installing 10 locations in san francisco is that a start or what is the goal that is just the start that is to meet and exceed our expectations of our initial partnership as a top innovator for yes sf so that's our yes sf pilot but then we are looking to expand far past that wonderful thank you so much tia Thank you, everyone. Please reach out. I'll put my email in the in the, um, in the chat. Thank you so much, Tia. Um, her contact information is in the chat. And again, we'll send that out afterwards. Next up, we have Cynthia from Moxion. So I am bringing you up the co-host, and you should be able to share screen. Awesome. I think there we go. All right. Give me just a second here. Okay. All look okay? okay. Fantastic. Well, um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. Uh, my name is Cynthia Long, and I'm the Senior Manager of Strategy and Partnerships here at Moxion. Um, so 
when we think of how you get temporary power, a lot of us think of using a generator. I think the go-to is a gas generator, diesel generator. And our founders went on a hike four years ago, a little bit over four years ago, and saw a diesel generator powering a light, light um, on a hike and was like, there has to be a better solution for this. And so they created a cleaner solution um, for industries that rely on temporary power and created the first all-electric alternative to diesel generator. So our flagship product is the MP7500. It is a, a 600 kilowatt hour battery pack, um, which is the equivalent of six Tesla Model 3s, um, essentially, um, in the footprint of a Tesla itself. So that is a lot of energy storage in a very small pack, and you will not find any other competitor on the market that has that much energy um, in the same footprint. Um, there's 75 kilowatts of power, max power output uh, for an hour and also 40 kilowatts uh, continuous. And a lot of things that make this um, a really highly functional product is that we have a structural battery pack that really designed for ruggability and durability because part of the things that we've seen so far is a lot of stationary storage, but not something that put it on wheels. And so our engineers really built that around mobility and portability to be able to bring batteries where you need it. Um, the custom module design means that everything is extremely powered, uh, energy dense. Um, we have a software stack that all, not only makes our batteries um, energy providers, but really ones that you can monitor for data, understand your potential carbon emissions that you're avoiding, also monitor for power output and, um, and leverage that into the efficiency of your, of your deployment. In addition to that, we also have had an inverter structure. So we're really looking at a, an extremely high conversion efficiency so that you're truly getting um, no, like very little energy loss when it comes to converting from DC to AC. And the versatility of the product is we have three different voltage modes. So we have 480, 480, 480 volt three phase, um, 208 three phase, and 122.40 split phase. So 480 three phase is what you'd find on a construction site or DC fast charger, super high powered stuff. 208 volts is what you'd find on film sets and live events. And 122.40, if you think of that, that's the same kind of outlets you find at home. And so really, when you think about this product, we really maximize for portability and versatility so that no matter what application you have, this could suit you. Um, so on some uh, some of the applications that we work into, we actually uh, provide for a number of industries, um, one of which is EV charging. Um, when it comes to the whole electrification push right now, we're thinking about uh, getting these EVs on, on the road, but how do you actually ensure that they stay charged? And how do you also ensure that early adopters can also use these? So in the EV charging space, we found that pop-up charging stations are a great use of our products so that if you don't have charging infrastructure, you can use ours there first, um, which also helps when you have a, uh, a public safety shutoff event and you have an electric vehicle in a, uh, in a neighborhood that needs to be charged. We bridge infrastructure gaps. So as you're also waiting for charging infrastructure, we can actually be the charging aspect of that. Grid resilience, so that when you electrify a fleet, it keeps moving, even though the grid might go down. And also peak shaving. So for EV fleets as well, when they have to charge during peak hours, this is a way to help mitigate some of the costs for demand charges to allow for savings on cost as a fleet manager. And just showing a few pictures of like how we have also configured this to helping the tra power truck fleets, also office lot, parking lot charging, and also, this is actually a picture from our office. Uh, we set up level two charging uh, in the in the parking lot where there wasn't level two charging already. And that's something I think that's a really exciting um, push for us, especially with companies that may not have that infrastructure in place and may want to get that um, charging up sooner. Uh, we also DC fast charging. So as I mentioned, that 75 kilowatt max output, um, this is where you can DC fast charge your really high powered, high powered vehicles. In addition to that, I mentioned live events, so food trucks and EVs. We've had four food trucks at Bottle Rock last year. We do sound stages. So when you're thinking about sound being so important for those artists, that's where we come in. Uh, media walls, so those bright, like flashing video walls, we can we can take those on too, as well as trailers and facilities and vendor tents. Um, in the film space too, I've been on every film set we've done in LA or film deployment. We do everything from set power where you're powering the lights on set, the base camp, which is similar to trailers you see in construction spaces or command centers, pseudo fleets like EV chargers, work trucks, and also EV charging. 
And also tying this back, because I think this is actually what would be really relevant to San Francisco, as we're thinking about construction as well, there's all that, always that temp power need before um, you get actual lines connected from PG&E. Um, this is another great way to get power on site that's not a diesel generator. And I think there's a lot of different use cases that we really see in construction right now that could be replaced there. In addition to that, we also have equipment charging. So as we have major, um, major manufacturers come out with electric excavators, those have the same problems as EVs. They need to charge in between construction. So this is how um, we've actually found ourselves as a, as a good charging solution. And of course, just a few more images about job site electrification and also job site charging. And then lastly, for utilities, we do front run infrastructure. So ensuring that before your interconnection is there, we can provide that. Um, storm restoration, just like we have with pg &E outages right now, that is something we can support. Um, and also emergency power. So we're thinking about having to set up a command center when the grid goes down, when there is an emergency response, this is where we can come in. And of course, seasonal hotspots. So tying that back to last year or two years ago, when we almost had a brownout and we had to collectively as a state have to reduce our energy load. We can supply that energy storage just to break that a little bit. And just a few more shots about some other uh, applications from many different ways you can use energy storage. But on top of that, though, we have a uniquely experienced team that consists of many different companies from um, Tesla, LG Chem, Flexport, Honeywell, you name it. We've thought we have uh, a lot of folks from the battery and manufacturer and EV industry to really make world class products. And when it comes to the case points so far, we've worked with Amazon Studios, we've worked with the PGA Tour in Atlanta for live sports events, and we've also looked at um, live like festivals like Austin City Limits. And I think these draw very strong parallels to Outside Lands, um, uh, other film that might happen in San Francisco here and there. Um, but more recently, we've also been working with uh, the city of San Francisco uh, to power an unhoused community outside of Candlestick Point where we are powering three rows of RV trailers um, and supplying them with clean power. Um, in addition to that, though, to close this, uh, almost wrap this out, is we do have manufacturing locations here in the Bay Area. So we are right across the Bay in Richmond. Um, if you take the ferry from the uh, ferry building, you can come to our office. And we're in the old Ford factory plant right now with the manufacturing facility set up um, to make about 1,100 of these units per year. Uh, we're also building out the, the uh, Terminal 3, which is the property across the street, which will have the capacity of 11,000 per year. Um, and the exciting thing, too, outside of this is that we do also provide these batteries as a service. So if you don't have infrastructure on site, we can rent these units out and also swap batteries out so that we take care of the charging. All you have to worry about is telling us when you need power. Um, so with that, I do invite you to electrify the future with us. I am a native San Franciscan, so I'm extremely excited to find ways that we can collaborate with San Francisco, get less generators out on there. And we are we are incredibly local and manufacture right here at home. So would love to find ways to support you all. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, kick us off with a couple of more questions to you. So from the day that I give you a call to order my Moxion, uh, a battery, uh, how quickly can you get that out to my job site? Ooh, uh, I mean, if you give us the order, all your details, how many you need and where, we could get that in a in a few days, a week or even less than that. I think it just depends on how much detail we have. Um, but whoever asked that question, please do reach out and let's see if we can get you one. We have we have available ones on rent right now. So we have availability from from our office. And can you tell us a little bit about what the charging process is? So if we needed mm -hmm. one of these batteries for the entire job site, and um, obviously you would have to swap them out. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what that experience on the service side is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, on the service side, what would happen, um, we call it their energy solutions business. And so essentially what we do is we rent out a unit to you. Um, and let's say you rent it out for three weeks. Uh, you use up a battery capacity within one week. Uh, what we would do is out of our Richmond office, that's actually where our first location is, um, we would be able to monitor your your power use over over like over our um, our software. Basically bring a fully charged battery to your site, swap the old one back and tow it back to Richmond to charge. 
And I think the other exciting thing, too, is also explore partnerships, too, whether we can partner with other charging partners to see if we can even charge closer by. But um, that would be how the swap service would operate. If you were to do a hybrid situation where you want to charge this off of a generator, and I know that sounds a little counterintuitive from a sustainability standpoint, but it does actually save diesel fuel and actually help with maintenance of generators um, or even charge it anywhere for that matter. This uh, port over here is actually a CCS combo plug for a level two or DC fast charger where you can charge your batteries up that way. Um, of course, I fully encourage charging off the grid when and where you can, especially because we have Clean Power SF to have 100% renewable energy. Um, I think also our strive as a company is to charge as much off renewables on site and then to supplement that elsewhere. Great. Uh, do you have a rent to buy uh, option? And then is there a warranty on the purchase? Yeah, uh, we absolutely do can do that. I think right now, so far, we've just done rent or buy, but I I will say right now, we are more than happy to be creative in terms of the rent to buy option and to work that out. And then um, we do have a warranty on that. Um, I have to double check exactly how long. I believe it's a one-year warranty right now, up to three years. So we'll just need to, um, I'll check in back with our maintenance and operations team to confirm. Excellent, wonderful. There are no other questions. Great. Awesome. Feel free to reach out to myself or Sean, Zach. Both of us are local, so happy to support where we can. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and as a reminder, emails are being dropped in the chat as long as the uh, as well as the websites for each of these great great companies. So if you want to explore them a bit more, um, with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our next top innovator. That is with Posh Electric. So I'm bringing you up now to co-host, where you'll be able to share your screen. Perfect. Well, let's see. Uh, Wes, I think your sound might not be on. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wesley. I'm the founder and CEO of Posh. Um, we are a company in the Bay Area. Um, today, I would like to touch upon some of the work that we are doing that be relevant to the real estate industry. So on our side, we build sustainable energy storage solution and uh, we also do battery um, uh, recycling and reuse. Uh, but uh, on today's presentation, I'll touch on some of the work that we've, uh, that we've been doing with some of the commercial and industrial clients. Um, so probably most of you are aware that starting 2023, last year, January 1st, uh, the California Title 24 uh, requirement um, mandates all new construction to have solar and uh, storage uh, installed as part of any new build or major renovation. And uh, Title 24 requirement put uh, new standards on energy efficiency, um, as well as they provide the financial uh, financial incentive to to put uh, renewable uh, on every uh, building uh, that that can put solar and batteries on. And this include uh, residential and commercial buildings. Uh, and to enable um, uh, the state's transition uh, transition to renewable energy. Uh, we've been working on um, uh, a plug and play energy storage solution to uh, enable rapid deployment of these type of batteries that uh, doesn't require a lot of installation costs. Um, so far, we have done a, a few projects with uh, some commercial and industrial clients to help them with uh, both power backup and demand management. And we have a proven track record of um, getting these batteries out and getting them installed um, uh, in, um, in, a, in a very rapid fashion. Um, how can we help? Um, again, because of the Title 24 uh, requirement uh, um, is, is mandated to put solar in storage. And uh, our objective is to uh, have a system that uh, uh, doesn't require uh, a lot of effort for integration uh, as well as installation. At the same time, we provide a lifetime service. All our batteries come with a 10 year warranty. Uh, that uh, are UL certified. And we also maintain and operate the battery throughout the lifetime with our EMS system. Uh, you can uh, monitor data uh, um, over the cloud um, and our backend will track the performance of the system to tell you when um, the battery need to be maintained or um, uh, there's any 
uh, issues that need to get fixed. Um, this type of pro um, system will help improve the project marketability uh, because um, with solar and storage, you can substantially reduce the energy cost uh, for uh, either the tenants or uh, your customers. At the same time, they're able to um, be more resilient because uh, the batteries also add a layer of resiliency when there is a power outage. Uh, some of the success stories uh, here, we, uh, we have developed a system for uh, a food manufacturing uh, facility in Southern California. Uh, we add uh, about 500 kilowatt hour of batteries to help them with demand management and uh, power backup. Uh, we also work with another company in the Bay Area to help Shabot College build an entire microgrid. Um, uh, and the microgrid allowed them to um, not only be uh, more energy efficient and energy resilient, but at the same time, it uh, served as an educational program for uh, the college. We are local. Uh, we have a, currently have a 10,000 square feet facility uh, in Hayward, California. We are expanding to another 10,000 square feet this year. Um, we do most of R&D and integration um, uh, in our facility. And we also have a strong engineering team uh, that, that provide all the technical support. Uh, we are very fortunate to have some of the uh, strongest investors and partners uh, that have, um, trust us and provide financial and technical support um, to, to bring us today. Uh, on my side, my background is in batteries. I spent about six years doing battery research at Stanford and then started an uh, EV tour company uh, back in 2015. We sold the company and now I'm back to the renewable space. Uh, I've worked with for about a couple of years and he's probably one of the best engineers that I've ever met. Uh, Bobby uh, is an industrial veteran uh, in the energy space, and my my good friend James uh, also helped us a lot with uh, some of our BD and partnership. Uh, we'd love to see how we can uh, work with uh, 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 some of the real estate companies in, in San Francisco in the Bay Area uh, to see how we can help um, with your projects. And if you need any uh, battery or any question about energy storage or renewable, uh, happy to chat. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, so pose a similar question to you as, as um, Moxion, which is um, how quickly can you get your batteries out to the site? Yeah, so this is actually one of our uh, advantage. Uh, if you talk to most of the suppliers in the industry, um, uh, a lot of battery supply out there um, have a lead time of about 12 to 18 months. And this is uh, as historical a big problem uh, because our ability to work with uh, multiple, uh, multiple different cell suppliers and we have a very uh, agile process of integrating these batteries. We are talking about days and not months. Um, and um, that's why a lot of customers come to us because we have batteries available. Great. And can you tell us a bit about the servicing on your batteries? If we need to swap them out, what is that process like? Yeah, so um, we have an EMS system. They are monitoring the battery 24-7. And uh, because of the modular design, um, we, um, we are able to uh, swap out any module if uh, need be. And for all our system deploy, we offer 10-year warranties. So most of the time, um, uh, we, we probably fix the problem before the customer even know about it. Excellent. Can you uh, share a couple of examples of where uh, we might have seen your battery being used? Uh, give us uh, an idea of the, because you have a couple of different products. So tell us uh, what kind of project fit would be best for which product. Yeah, most of our customers are people who are paying a couple hundred thousand dollars to one, two million dollars per year for the electricity bill. Uh, and for most of those clients, they have a significant portion of the electricity bill for demand charge. So that's on top of the, the kilowatt hour they are paying. They, they have to pay um, um, additional demand charge as some sort of penalty. Uh, and what we found is that for a lot of these customers, we uh, can give them a very good payback time between three to five years uh, with uh, this type of battery installed. One of the example customer I, I mentioned in the slide is a food processing companies uh, in Southern California. Um, and uh, they are, they're using a lot of electricity because of um, uh, the cold storage. and uh, they're looking for resiliency as well. So uh, uh, facility that are using a lot of electricity uh, will be the ideal customers. Great. Okay, if no other questions, thank you so much, Wesley. Appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to give Sun Ice Energy a moment 
uh, to see if they're able to rename themselves if they're on. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and bring uh, Flower Turbines. Daniel, we're happy to have you. I'm going to make you co-host here now. Uh, it looks like Michael is online from Sun Ice. Uh, perhaps he's unable to rename himself. Emily, is there a way to elevate? I'm not seeing a Michael. See, how about Dan, if you're ready, let's go ahead and hear from Flower Turbines and we'll work on getting Sun Ice Energy up next. Okay. Um, so let me share the screen. <clears throat> okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Daniel Farb. I'm the founder of Flower Turbines. We're a small wind energy company that uh, and we believe that we have the technology that can make us as big as solar because we've solved the problems that have been holding small wind energy back. Uh, very often low noise and efficiency don't mix. Turbines close together interfere with each other. It makes it very hard to put into an urban or semi-urban setting. The aesthetics and the danger to birds. So, um, We've solved it all, and we've been recognized for it. One of the most fundable solutions in the United States, uh, the Department of Energy and the Solar Impulse Foundation. And this is flower turbines. It's beautiful, it's efficient. They make their neighbors perform better. Now, um, I have two ideas for projects for San Francisco. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about um, how each of them, and I think both of them, can be implemented in San Francisco. So this is just showing you a couple of installations. And um, in addition to the turbines alone, we have charging stations using the turbines. I'll come back to that later. Uh, this shows our technology. It shows how the uh, aerodynamics are such that we both improve the efficiency over what academics have thought could be accomplished in the past. And we also make it so that they create waves of energy of higher wind velocity near them. And that's the cluster or bouquet effect. Uh, we have many patents for this. Um, this is very important. This is the game changer, bouquet effect. The more turbines you put close to each other in the right way, they make each other perform better. So putting four next to each other is like having eight separate. That's a game changer. And that means that one of the things we're looking for is to place a small cluster in San Francisco, uh, maybe in a park, maybe on a rooftop. We're going to try to find out. Um, I think in the audience is Maca Cola, who will help us try to find locations um, representing us in San Francisco. And the other thing, you can see how they start at lower speeds. Most turbines start producing energy here, three meters per second. We're already starting to produce small amounts, but below one meter per second. That has to do with the uh, efficiency of it. So um, there is an immense market for doing this in large numbers. And compared to solar, one of the special things about it is that um, we are much higher per square foot in terms of energy and payback than solar. So um, let me now show you um, one of our products that we make with it, which is charging stations for e-bikes, for phones, other small mobility, wheelchairs, et cetera. And we can do this better than anybody else because we start at low speeds. We have an urban design that's beautiful. They're durable at high speeds. We put them on a truck. Uh, top of the truck in Texas and got 125 miles per hour. Um, they move from wind at any angle. They're quiet, bird friendly, and efficient. So we have a whole series of them. We twice won the Netherlands Sustainability Award for these products. Um, we have some intellectual property regarding them, and we're making a new version that's not as slim that can go on parks and beaches. 
Uh, our current approach is that the municipality or the corporation buys them and they are free to use. They can be customized. Here's the climate minister of the Netherlands at the inauguration of one of our e-bike uh, charging systems. And we have them several locations in Europe already. Um, and we're looking forward to bringing them to the United States. So uh, <clears throat> basically we're offering um, as part of the yes San Francisco program, uh, two applications. One is a cluster of turbines and the other is setting up the infrastructure for e-biking. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Michael. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, in terms of the clustering? Daniel. Of... Oh, Daniel. so sorry, um, my... Daniel, my fault. Michael is our representative who uh, just, um, I think right. is in the audience. Well, hi both, <laughs> Michael and Daniel. Um, could you tell us a little bit about <laughs> the clustering uh, on top of buildings, perhaps the weight considerations that we would have to uh, take into account if we were to add something like this to a roof roofing structure? So you would have to have a civil engineer take a look at it. Um, but it depends upon the strength of the roof, of course. And we have different sizes, so the different sizes might work better. And we have some um, interesting new products, uh, which I didn't show you, that um, basically enable it to fit on a roof in combination with solar without any bolts into the roof itself. Um, this is, by the way, a granted patent for slanted roofs. We're waiting to patent it for flat roofs. Um, the, um, it basically spreads out the weight and uh, enables it to be put in without the risk of shearing the roof off if there's an extreme wind. So um, this is one of the ways in which we can handle it, but you should always have your local engineer just check on the strength of the roof. Right. Could you talk a little bit about your warranty as well as the production uh, turnarounds? So we are making our turbines to last 20 to 40 years. Um, the warranty is currently two years. Um, usually you need to check the bearings with the bigger ones uh, and put in a little bit of oil to replace it every one to two years. Um, our production for the EU is in the EU and for the United States it's in Texas. We have our own warehouse and we uh, and some of our own production machines there. Right, and there's a question for you about uh, whether or not a turbine can stand on its own and how long is the uh, installation? I don't know what you mean by stand on its own. You have to have it connected to something. Either... Stand alone, I think is the way the question came in. Oh, so as you see on the, um, uh, uh, for example, here, um, it is standalone as part of the charging station. So it can be alone, but, uh, and standing alone, it actually has efficiencies that make it equivalent to the well-known horizontal axis turbines um, that are noisy and have other kinds of issues. Um, but the point is, is that by putting them together, you make, you have an incredible achievement of being able to place turbines close together, which otherwise you can't. And on top of that, they make each other perform better. Right, and then what about installation time? So it depends on um, which product, how much. Uh, the rooftop product I, sh uh, I told you about, where you can just put the turbines in, it it's two people can handle in less than a day. As you see, two people here installed this on some concrete. Um, the other turbines, the insulation depends on the size and how many turbines, but we've made them uh, so that basically two people in some of the bigger models, you may need a crane, but two people can assemble them fairly easily. The small one I assembled myself in 10 minutes. They said, okay, you're the CEO, let's see how you do. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Daniel. Uh, did your colleague want to say anything uh, else? We've gone um, through our so, list of questions. So I put my email uh, in the chat and we're looking forward to um, working with ev everyone to make what has heretofore been a small segment of renewable energy into a major one that hopefully you'll see on rooftops, in parks, along commuter areas, um, in the port area, the, um, all kinds of different areas all around San Francisco. Great, excellent. Certainly some opportunities with lead buildings. Um, well, very well. I think we're gonna try to bring Sun Ice Energy uh, back on deck. Emily, are you able to um, transition? I Thank you. have been elevated now, so you should be able to share your video and screen. Thank you all for your patience. Awesome. Hello, hello. Can you uh, see the presentation? Ah, excellent. Very good. Okay. The spot that you're really favorite. Okay. So um, this is Michael Sadler from Sun Ice Energy. Um, our company is based in Singapore. Today, I'd like to present a revolutionary technology which can replace traditional air conditioning units. Our thermal storage system has changed the solar powered world uh, from what previously wasn't possible. With a few hours of solar per day, we can cool an environment anywhere from 0.4 Fahrenheit, negative 18 degrees, so completely frozen, to ambient, completely off grid for a minimum of 24 hours, if not longer. So we are gaining interest with a lot of real estate developers around the world because a solution addresses some well-known issues that haven't been able to be addressed in the past. The common challenges, fulfilling corporate responsibility, maintaining good ROI, getting rid of humidity issues and cutting down on maintenance while having a futuristic sleek look. So our thermal storage system addresses four main areas. Solar. Solar solutions to date can only work during the sun shines and once the sun goes down, everything stops. Capacity issues. As temperatures rise, the requirement for air conditioning goes up, causing stress on the grid, as you saw last year in California. Air conditioning, knowing condensation, mold issues, and the inability to hit the right temperature and maintain the right humidity levels is commonplace. Lastly, aesthetics, the noise and design. So our system can drastically reduce or eliminate your AC bills. It's perfect for off-grid or unstable grids, and it only needs a few hours of solar to operate around the clock. We don't need the grid, diesel, backup power, but they can easily be integrated. Our technology is non-toxic, recyclable, safe in terms of fl flammability, and it has a 50-year lifespan, so no maintenance. It uses a natural, renewable resource, eliminating CO2 emissions. Humidity control is built into the system. It comes standard, no mold, no condensation, and of course it cuts down on maintenance. Lastly, all our technology and equipment is built into the walls or for the ice skating rink under the ground, and it's silent, unlike air conditioners. Cool air is released at low velocity from the ground and silently. So let's quickly just take a look at, at, at the technology. We capture solar or wind power or anything like that, and we store it in a substance called PCM, phase change material. Um, when a change occurs between a liquid and solid and back again, there's large amounts of latent energy which is released and absorbed. We have seven pending patents wrapped around capturing this energy. So just to give you a very quick overview, solar panels or wind uh, captures energy and it drives a compressor or water chiller charging our system. Four points to note, everything apart from our solution is off the shelf. Buy them in any country in the world. Secondly, operational costs are drastically reduced as the equipment only needs to run for about two to three hours per day versus being on for 24 hours. Human Humidity control, as I said, is standard.
and Michael, I'm so sorry to interrupt your video. Um, it's amazing. It might help if you turn your video off for a moment and then your Wi-Fi might be a bit stronger. Okay, how about that? Wonderful, thank you. Sorry, we love seeing you, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay, so this is just to show you what it looks like inside. Uh, the left one is what you see in a container and that's the next picture is um, it being insulated. And this is one of the ice walls that we have used um, in Indonesia, which I, I will discuss shortly. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to give you a flavor of four different projects that we're doing. So you can see the technology and the temperatures that we can operate. Uh, beginning on the left in Singapore, we have 20 and 40 foot containers that have been completely off grid for one year now, maintaining a constant ambient temperature inside, humidity controlled. For those of you who have been to Singapore, you will know that the average humidity level is around 82% year round and 89 Fahrenheit. We use around three hours of solar per day to charge the system for at least 24 hours. Um, it gives back another 50% of the solar isn't used, so it can be used for other things. Um, we're currently fulfilling orders on this, such as off-grid offices uh, to food storage. Secondly, we have built the world's first solar cooled ice skating rink in the world. Just like the containers, it needs three hours of solar to maintain this lab for a minimum of 24 hours, um, saving an operator roughly 300 to 600 K US in electricity alone, excluding all the other benefits. Our third project, still work in pro progress, but is going to be completed at the end of this year. It's a five story, 25 thousand square meter commercial building in Shanghai, China, using the same thermal storage solution for cooling and heated. It's covered by 7,000 square meters of solar panels. This has gained so much recognition in China that the Chinese government has awarded us a US $1 million prize uh, in the last year. Lastly, just before Christmas, we completed our first of 200 villas that are being built with our thermal storage solution. Um, it's hard to appreciate the sleekness of the villa from the picture, but our solution is hidden as the walls, as I showed you earlier. So it has a clean look, and most importantly for that area, it eliminates humidity from a very hot and humid climate. Um, again, it can be completely off-grid. So looking at how it compares to mains and generators. So the CapEx for PCM plus solar currently stands at around eight cents per kilowatt hour. Um, we predict this will drop to four cents once people use more PCM. Um, the OPEX for Sun Ice is zero. If you look at what a diesel generator, including maintenance, it ranges anywhere from 80 cents to US $5 per kilowatt hour. Um, our system has a ROI of around three years, and then your AC bills effectively are free after that. So I hope this provides you a little overview of what we are doing. We're doing quite a lot, and I look forward to answering your questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for the presentation, Michael. A uh, question about the implementation time. How long would it take you to install one of these systems? So typically, we we our sweet spot spot is new builds because everything is built into the walls. So in Bali the installation was, and that was a 35 square meter unit, it's it's about one and a half weeks to install the units, the solar panels and everything. There's about a three month lead time um, to get the equipment. But as I said, the solar panels, the inverters, the compressors, you can get from your own um, construction company, whoever, or your own builder. So we only do a little niche, even though we can provide everything. And how should we think about your technology in terms of um, application on uh, the types or size of projects? Is your product best used on single family homes or large scale developments? What do you what would you say is the ideal application? Our, our sweet spot is in the sun belt because we are solar, but of course you can use wind, we can use whatever renewable resource. Um, 
in locations where the grid might have issues or might not be stable, um, where humidity levels are high. We can do, we have tenders out for Olympic size ice skating rinks, which we have unofficially won. Um, we are doing projects from Saudi to Bahamas to Singapore to Maldives from um, hotel developments um, and sustainable developments. Uh, we found that the people who have to pay the bills are very interested. If it's just a builder selling on to an end user, not so much, but if it's a hotel developer who maintains that asset and we effectively um, eliminate their utilities bill, they're, they're very interested in us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Michael. I will now introduce another Michael, uh, Michael from Butler. I'm going to go ahead and bring you up as co-host. So you should be able to see me now. Right. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, thank you. All right, are you seeing my screen? Yes, looks good. Perfect. All right, well, my name is Michael Marriott. I'm Senior Enterprise Account Executive here at Butler, and I'll be showing you around what our offering is today. So what is Butler? Who is Butler? We've created this tiny sensor that takes surface temperature and is an input and translates it into indoor location, body pressure, and occupancy data within a space. We offer the world's first occupancy solution that's wireless, has multi year, uh, has a multi life or multi life or multi year battery life, and probably most importantly, is 100% private. This allows us to go into spaces um, that camera based solutions just aren't able to. A little bit of background on the company. So, we started in 2019 as an MIT spin up. These are our two founders, Hung Hao and Gianni. Um, and they were looking for sensors for residential usage at that point in time. But then when COVID hit, it kind of changed everything. It you know, put everything on its head. Um, and this is one of the slides that used to be a bunch of, you know, when I started a year and a half ago, it was a bunch of fancy PhDs from these very, very prestigious universities. Um, but since then, we've really quickly become the best sensing solution for commercial real estate and hybrid workplace on the market. Um, you know, these are all very well-known logos. Some of them are end, are end users and some of them are our partners like Carrier. Uh, one announcement we did make at the end of 2023 is we were awarded the new campus that Walmart's building in Bentonville, Arkansas that they call NEO. Um, between the new campus and then their existing buildings, it's going to be roughly 32 buildings and 10,000 devices. Uh, these devices aren't only going to be focused on how they want to run they want to get their occupancy analytics, but how they can reach those sustainability requirements that they have for their tech campus. What does that data look like? Here on the right is our aggregated data dashboard where you can see your workplace and occupancy performance that global workplace teams use to make leasing decisions. Now on the left, you can see the granular detail of which desks are being used, which ones aren't being used. Um, and then the companies. What a lot of companies do is they'll integrate us into their desk and room booking reservation system to help build out automations like auto booking and auto releasing. This not only helps on the square footage savings, um, but to better utilize the space that you're already in. One vertical that we do touch on now because we've just moved into it. So be because of the machine learning within our sensor, our sensors become smart enough to tell if a person is standing up, sitting down, or lying down. So we've moved into senior living because we can do fall detection. We've recently won a grant that is allowing us to do research on not only fall detection, but fall prevention off active data. So how can we supply data to prevent that future fall inside a senior living space? Now on the sustainability aspect, which is what we're here talking about today, um, and how Butler can help reduce your carbon footprint by 2050. A large portion of commercial real estate is being underutilized. Class A office space is meant to be roughly 250 square foot per person, but in actuality, in today's marketplace, it's closer to double that. An example of this is the space that's shown on the right. In the morning, people come in for their early meeting. They'll go have a cup of coffee on the couches and chat. In the afternoon, lunchtime, they'll move into the cafe. And then about 2.30, everybody goes home. 
except for the poor receptionist to sit there in the corner. So what they what this company was using before is badge data that showed that the space was highly utilized because everybody checks in in the morning. That's why I really give them a piece of the data. All actuality, the percentage of use in the space is very low. Because of this, Butler, uh, because of this, we look at Butler's having the ability to be the nerve cell of the space. If you optimize the same footprint with hybrid work, automations that can cut CO2 out, output in half, you know, on top of that, you can use this occupancy data for lighting control and more, more importantly, HVAC controls. So you can reduce that carbon footprint from 2.5 to 2.23. HVAC is roughly 60% of the building's energy costs. And with integrations like the one we have with Carrier, not only can meet your CO2 requirements, but gain that all important return on investment. And then just to touch on the very last part, we do also have an AI plugin to use occupancy as an input to help design and layouts for future workspace. This will give you suggestions on best utilization, collaboration, and sustainability of your future spaces. Any questions I can help with? Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, well, first question is, can you talk a little bit about how uh, data is stored and owned and data security? Yeah, so our data is stored here in the US. Um, we have AWS currently, and we are offering an Azure Ops in here soon. Uh, the data is collected and stored to the cloud one of three ways, really. It can be over the internet, so POE back to a server. We also have Wi Fi options if you're okay with us being on your Wi Fi. And then for those companies who have IT security requirements where there's nothing a lot on their Wi Fi, we do have a cellular option as well. Great. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how can your system be integrated for dynamic energy um, uh, adjustments? Uh, what kinds of uh, products is your uh, is your are your sensors uh, compatible with, or is it compatible across everything that's on the market? Yeah. So we offer our a API at no additional cost. We really want to be able to work with the tech stack, tech stack that you already are using, utilizing. Um, I mean, we have some great partners like Carrier that I mentioned, but there's also the InfoGrids of the world, the Relogics of the world um, that utilize our sensors to give that occupancy data for their, their end user, their BMS. Right. Um, okay, great. Uh, last question. Can you tell us a little bit about your pricing or pricing structure? Yeah, so our pricing structure is, is, a, is a sensing as a service. So we are a software solution on top of not only having the, our own hardware. Um, what we do is we charge per sensor. So I'd love to be able to give you a, a flat fee, but we're a la carte. So whatever the use case that you're trying to um, solve for is what we want to meet. You know, one of the use cases we're seeing quite a bit, even on the sustainability side, is like a traffic-based cleaning. Um, so we'll put one of our sensors because it doesn't have a camera. We can count ins and outs of the bathroom without, you know, being, you know, stepping over the privacy line. Um, and we just had a, a customer, they did, you know, 10 bathrooms, 10 restrooms. So instead of cleaning them on a schedule, they're cleaning them on usage. And they, what they've done is scaled it up to it, roughly $20,000 of savings within year one by rearranging their, their cleaning schedule. Interesting. Well, great. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again, Michael. All right, I'm elevating now Kobe from 374 Water. You should be able to share your video and screen now. Hey guys, good uh, good to be here. Uh, so I'm Kobe. I'm Kobe Nagar. I'm the um, co-founder and chairman of 374 Water. Um, I drink water and I'm really excited about waste, uh, but today I'm a little bit under the weather. So I'm going to talk about the alternative future that we are, are creating versus the typical sales pitch. Um, and the one key takeaway that I want everybody from this conversation to have is uh, when you go and think about uh, your toilet, next time that you go, think about it as uh, the biggest uh, uh, the biggest loss of energy that you have in the building. Uh, and what we have discovered that 
uh, we as society really, you know, really using uh, water and waste in a, in a way that is not efficient. Uh, we we look at that as a as a as a very linear industry that you're consuming water at the end user at the end user at the building, and then you're uh, generating wastewater that you're sending out miles and miles to a central centralized wastewater treatment uh, facility. And same goes for uh, other organic waste like food waste, uh, plastic, and, and paper um, and cardboard, which is you know if we. If you subscribe to Amazon, you get you get a lot of them. Uh, so the alternative uh, future that we have created, and this is how we how we come up with it, is uh, looking at, at that waste as as energy, as energy that we can use and recycle. And, and what we have um, what we have discovered again through the technology um, through the technology technology development that we have done is there is actually a way to take your uh, your organic waste, all the organic matter, and convert it back into something that the community and society needs, uh, meaning uh, you can take your organic waste and convert it into clean water, energy, uh, and minerals. And we're really doing that with, uh, with a pretty innovative technology with a bombastic name called Supercritical called water oxidation, but essentially it's using water and air to, to enable to enable that magic. And the alternative uh, future that we're creating is again, let's let's look at that. let's look at community more like um, more like a circle, how we can utilize what we are generating from the from the waste perspective uh, and create something that, that society can use. Um, and um, right now, again, we've been we've been extremely successful uh, using our system for uh, for municipal waste, uh, industrial wastewater, uh, and other type of waste that so like until now were weren't really able you weren't really able to treat, and with uh, with the ability to to do something else, we call it you know treat the impossible. Um, you can really take it. Uh, and take sustainability and take building of communities um, and building management to to a different level. Uh, and that's that's the future that that we have creating in three seventy four. Uh, from we're looking for developers that uh, want to set to to really get serious about waste and want to set a new standard in the industry about uh, about a circular holistic uh, view of of the ins and out of communities um so that's that's my pitch for today and would love to would love to collaborate with people that wants to create that future great thank you kobe for sharing could you tell us a little bit about um the size of the treatment system and where uh what would it be an ideal uh, setting to be placed. Uh, so for example, if somebody here is building a new uh, community of homes, uh, how much space should they be uh, considering in order to uh, accommodate one of your systems? Great, great question. So uh, so the system that we have are very compact. So the, the smaller scale system that we have, which is designed for about 6,000 Six thousand people. Uh, when you talk about wastewater, is is only a forty foot container. So that's that's about a thousand times, three order of magnitude smaller than what exists from uh, other biological treatment uh, facilities. And the idea is is really integrating uh, that type of infrastructure in in the in the ground floor or the basement of a building or a, or a cluster of buildings. Uh, for one, one example is is a project that we're actually doing in Houston, uh, which is a mixed use development that have a residential, commercial, and some restaurants. And uh, what we what we're going to do in that project is really taking all of the waste that the complex is generating, and then produce uh, clean water uh, heat that can be used for heating the building. Uh, and also, uh, and also mineral minerals uh, that can that can can be used as a fertilizer. Uh, so really creating that that circular economy, 
uh, as you can see from the diagram, you know, the vision is actually incorporating that with uh, with enhanced farming. And there are some uh, really uh, smart innovators on this call that uh, uh, that can help us on that front. Uh, but again, really thinking about how, how we create that circle uh, around waste. Great. Thank you so much, Kobe. We've run out of time, so we're going to move it along. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Emily. You feel better. <laughs> uh, you. Next up in our water and waste category is Andrew from Washbox. Andrew, I'm elevating you now. Wonderful. There you are. Hello. Hello, everybody. Let me see if I can share my screen here and we'll get underway. I think this is the one. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that screen. Looks good. Okay, so um, Washbox is here to solve a problem um, that the construction industry, in some instances, doesn't even know it has. Um, there's a legacy practice of directing um, finishing trades like painters, plasterers, tilers, and renderers that need to keep tools clean on construction projects to wash their tools into the sewer. And this is a, it's a bit of a hidden menace, if you like, in the industry. It's creating lots of issues in terms of productivity, housekeeping, safety on construction projects. But there's also the uh, discharge of pollution to the environment. And there's a bit of a um, bit of an understanding or, or bit of a bit of a thought in the community that the sewer is a magic place where waste disappears. And to follow on from the the ideas of 374 water that um, the sewer is not a magic place where waste disappears. Everything that gets discharged to the sewer ends up back in the environment as a solid um, or a liquid. And so Washbox is here to, um, to solve that problem. So we have two units. The first is a, um, a larger pallet-based unit, which goes to a construction site. Um, and this particular device has two wash stations and all wet trades that normally wash their tools in, in water can use this particular device. So it plugs into standard power, but importantly, it doesn't need any plumbing connections at all. So when we take this unit to site, it'll be empty. We fill it with uh, about 150 gallons or 500 litres of water in this particular case. And then it can be located anywhere on the site, there's standard power. So that water that gets placed in the system on day one is the same water that's used for the entire project um, to enable their tra all the trades to wash their tools each day. And that is um, the case whether the project goes for three months um, or in fact, you know, two years or beyond. The other system we have is a trolley mounted system. Um, it works exactly the same as the larger unit. However, this one's on a really cool set of casters. Um, it's 790 mil wide, so it fits through most standard doorways. And so this system is ideal for construction fit out projects, uh, for hospitality, for any areas where you might have tight access in construction, um, or it might be a you know a project on the smaller scale where it doesn't have a, a high load of, of trades needed to wash their tools, um, but mobility and access around the site might be the most important factor. So the system in its operation runs automatically. And so compared to the traditional systems that might discharge waste to sewer, the wash box automatically recycles the water, automatically removes the waste, and puts the waste into these filter bags, which sit on top of the unit. And these bags need to be emptied by somebody on site each day. They contain about eight or nine kilos of waste each. And so each day, one of these systems has the capacity to capture somewhere in the, in the range of, of 45, 45 kilos or you know, maybe, maybe 10 gallons. Um, of solid waste that would otherwise find its way to the environment as a, as a wash water um, or liquid waste pollution. The mobility of this particular unit is really, really important to construction projects. Um, one of the limitations of having the, the sewer discharge drums in place is that they're fixed in position during the process of construction. And so what that means is that it creates a productivity barrier because 
if you have something that's physically plumbed into um, to a water point and to a discharge point in, that, that is there to enable tradespeople to wash their tools, then you, you meet this inflection point or this chicken or egg scenario at some point in the project where the project isn't finished um, because that particular device is still set up, um, but all the building might be finished around it. And you've still got trades that need to wash their tools, but at some point you need to you need to remove that fixed device so that the, the project can be finished. And so Watchbox eliminates that with this device because it can be used right up to the very last day of the project. So the user experience of Watchbox is, is really, really important for productivity. Um, you can see here that, that we're washing out a, a setting box. It's a plastering tool. And if you can imagine doing that, um, over a 44 gallon drum or, or sink in a, in a finished bathroom, it'd be a really challenging task for the tradespeople. So we're improving productivity for the tradespeople. We're improving um, uh, the, the productivity of the whole site, including reducing program days, which, which saves the, the construction general contractor um, a ton of money. And we're also improving other outcomes like safety and, um, and compliance. Washbox is a smart units. And so now we kind of delve into the, the sustainability space, which is what we're here to talk about primarily. And so Washbox eliminates the use of water um, for the washing of tools and completely eliminates the generation discharge of liquid waste. And the volumes can be quite staggering. We've got a project in Sydney uh, with Lendlease, which is a, um, an urban regeneration project of three residential towers and total water savings on that project at about the two thirds um, completion mark is just over 250,000 gallons. So that's a lot of lot of water and a lot of pollution that's been eliminated, including on that project, some 60 tonnes of solid paint, plaster, grout, sand, and cement, et cetera, that's been captured by the wash box automation and eliminated from discharge. So in terms of costing and getting a, a wash box onto a project in place of the, the legacy sewer discharge or sewer connected drums. Um, this can be challenging, um, particularly um, in an industry where these legacy practices have been around for a long time um, and liquid waste management, to be fair, is, is not um, kind of high on their radar. You know, construction is a, is a complex industry where they they do some, some pretty amazing things, dig a big hole in the ground and, and build the most amazing, environmentally friendly, sustainable buildings. Um, but liquid waste management's been kind of overlooked. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a bit of a hidden menace. And so in terms of costing it into a project, we're really looking for the GCs to hire this um, and assume responsibility for liquid waste on the project uh, in exactly the same ways they take responsibility for solid waste and provide a proper... Um, proper ergonomic and, and purpose-built wash station solution for all of their trades. Uh, in doing so, they'll get buy-in. We find that, that wash box is used predominantly by, by plastering and drywall trades, and as a next, then tilers um, and other, other trade contractors on site, such as block layers or, um, you know, guys doing, doing you know, screeds and, and cement and, and beds um, and other patching and filling work are also also users of the the system um in terms of the the value that it provides on the site we've got tangibles and intangibles if we eliminate the installation of the sewer connected drums then there's actually a a real dollar in the pocket um, cost saving that you can achieve and that can be substantial but there's a whole lot of other hidden and implicit costs that we address such as you know what what what's the impact to the to the site program if your sewer connected drum gets blocked um, or overflows or causes damage to um to finished areas in the building at removal? Um, what are the cost of trade waste permits or potential fines if you if you're found to be non-compliant with those? And so we're really looking to um, have a broad conversation with with the industry um, and in terms of what we're doing in San Francisco, look at the opportunity to to extend those conversations to um, corporate level in, in construction organisations and, and look at uh, what it would mean to change this practice across all of their sites so that we can, we can have a more sustainable and, um, and more productive construction uh, industry moving forward. Um, so that's about all for me at the moment. Are there any questions? 
Great. Thank you, Andrew. Just uh, one question for you. Um, given that your company is headquartered overseas, uh, what is your lead time for deploying in San Francisco? Let's say a, a construction project is ready to order some right now. Uh, how quickly can you get it over to us? So at the present time, um, our, our work to date in, in the US has been on the East Coast, um, although we have recently completed uh, one single project in um, Seattle. So we have stock um, in Jersey City at, at the moment. And so we have a obviously a transport and deployment time to get them into San Francisco. And we're currently working through some business planning um, and looking for some premises in San Francisco so that we can we can get ahead of the game there um, in the next in the coming months. But if there was any any projects that um, that were sort of on the radar, sort of at the present time, we're probably two to four weeks um, in terms of in terms of mobilizing in San Francisco. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Now I'm gonna bring up Alicia from Rainstick. You should be able to share your screen and video now. Righty, here we go, unmute myself. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just sharing my screen right now. Please let me know if you can see it okay on your end. Emily, all good? Looks good, go ahead. All right, fantastic. Hi, everybody, my name is Alicia and I'm the CEO and co-founder at Rainstick. Uh, current point in time, uh, someone in San Francisco uses approximately 80 to 90 gallons of water per person per day. It's our mission to build water technology that allows people to thrive using only 13. Why? Because it's wasteful, but it's also really expensive. Expensive for owners and building operators. 50% uh, of that water use stems from the bathroom, and that's where we're starting with the largest water consumer, uh, and that is the shower which uses approximately 25 gallons of water and it equals one third of water bills, one third of energy bills, uh, which is extensive. If we look at the, the alternative solutions to date in San Francisco, you may have heard of the purple plumbing uh, program. And the challenge with whole home gray water systems is that they're difficult to install. They require double plumbing, uh, they can be expensive to implement. Uh, they have water savings, but they don't capture the energy savings. And so that payback period, once you've gone through that install, can be anywhere between 15, 20 years plus if it ever pays back. We've seen other solutions in the market like low flow options, uh, which really don't save a lot of water. They just force compromise. But that's really been the only a lever that we've been able to pull uh, over the last few years. Uh, we've seen the regulated flow rate. It used to be three gallons per minute. California now has a 1.8 gallon per minute flow rate. So we've looked at this data and we've said, what can we do better in terms of water solutions? How can we save the substantial amount of water that we knew, but, but do so in a way that allows um, building projects that are not just new construction projects, but also bathroom renovations, uh, to take advantage of water savings opportunities. And that's really why we've developed Rainstick. It saves the same amount um, as a whole home gray water system, but it's in a single appliance, saves up to 80% water and energy, provides three gallons per minute out of the shower head. So it's substantial, almost double the shower pressure in terms of experience, saves a swimming pool's worth of water over the course of a year, pays back in less than four years. And if you have that asset over a 10 year period, you're gonna save over $11,000 once that asset is paid back. So in terms of how the technology works, we bring in fresh wat hot water and cold water at the start of every shower. So the system doesn't store any water in between sessions, but we do have a, um, uh, a small three and a half inch reservoir that sits at the base of the appliance. It's installed very similar to a linear drain. Um, and so once that water is brought into the system, we have a small pump on board, we capture, we reuse that drop up to six times, and we're also cleaning it in real time to avoid waste. So in terms of how we're cleaning it, we have a very efficient approach 
Um, we've uh, completed third, bar third party testing and achieved a 10 log reduction in water quality, which is almost essentially drinking water quality. And so we're using a micron liberal screen, we're using UV LED, we're constantly refreshing the loop. We have um, something we call Rainstick Original Cleaning Product that's only put into the system approximately one time per month to uh, maintain the integrity of the appliance. Uh, and then for property managers or the hospitality folks who like to track that water and energy savings in real time, we do have an optional uh, Wi-Fi wi application that allows you to track it down to the gallon in the kilowatt hour that's been saved. Uh, here's a case study over 12 months, uh, over 16,000 gallons of water was saved, which is even more substantial than some of the best whole home gray water systems. Um, in this case, we're Canada, we have very, very uh, low water rates still uh, we were able to save over $650. Um, this technology has um, been quite successful. We've brought it to some trade shows, Rain Sticks won uh, best time inventions list of 2023. Uh, the kitchen and bath shows gold award uh, out of 1800 applications, uh, won best of innovation at CES 2022. So uh, we're very excited with the the feedback that we've been receiving from the market to date. So in terms of San Francisco and our inv uh, involvement, I am extremely excited to announce that we are hiring our first business development manager for the region. And that's largely a uh, part of some of the, the support that we've received as part of this program. Uh, we are seeking up to five pilot partners uh, those partners uh, ideally are either single or multi-residential builders or developers um, and or they are a hospitality project partner. Uh, this benefit of this technology, you're going to save up to 80% water and energy, as I mentioned, up to $900 annually uh, per installed rain stick without the need for double plumbing. So if you're going through potentially a renovation project, this could be uh, an opportunity to try out this water saving technology. Um, we're fully compliant for install within North America. Um, and we are looking for um, an immediate timeline for some of these pilot projects. So in terms of the cost, uh, we can offer you one of two options. Option one is the asset. So that pays back uh, over a course of four years. Or we also have a, a rain stick leasing model. It's essentially financing that rain stick system. It's $1,500, but $700 a year for three years. Uh, your water and energy savings, I mentioned, will be up to $900. So uh, you can see that you're actually paying less than you're saving. So in terms of installation, uh, you're going to receive the systems uh, in two to four weeks. Uh, we have uh, the option of supplying you with a bathroom professional to help with the installations or you pick yours. Uh, you pick your finish, you pick your shower base if you decide to go that route or if you'd like tile, we'll supply the reservoir. Um, and then there's a 10 year warranty on the shower base, a two year uh, warranty on the appliance and a 10 year on the finish. So warranty and support is incredibly important to us. Uh, these are some of our project partners that we've worked with to date. Uh, the last thing I'll mention today is that we actually have some partners that are within the Bay Area, including Premier Bath and Kitchen. Uh, we're within their showrooms. Water Champions is a local installer that we work with. Um, so please feel free to reach out. Um, my email is quite small on this screen, but it's in the left upper corner. It's alicia at rainstickshower.com, or please uh, feel free to get in touch with some of the folks here, uh, but definitely would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. A uh, question about, uh, you refer to this as an appliance. Can you talk a little bit about the electrical connection that's required for your product? Yeah, so the appliance is, um, it's, it's a 12 volt system. So very similar in the bathroom space. So very similar to um, heated shower floors, um, or if you're going to be putting in um, any sort of spa-like experience within the bathroom. So it's very low voltage. Uh, you connect similar with your hot and your cold uh, supply, you're going to connect to 120 volts at the back of the appliance. Uh, we have some pretty in-depth uh, installation materials uh, that we can share uh, if you're interested. 
more question for you. Uh, you are uh, Canada based. Um, what is the uh, uh, turnaround for delivery looking like for you right now? So super quick, um, we do have uh, inventory. Uh, we also have inventory that's available right local in San Francisco right now, but otherwise it's two to four weeks. Great, excellent. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, so thanks much. for joining us. Um, we'll move along to Eric from Urban Machine. I'm going ahead and elevating you now. Go ahead and share your screen. Perfect. Looks good. Thanks, Eric. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Wong, co founder and CEO of Urban Machine. And we are on a mission to convert the 37 million tons of wood waste from construction and demolition into premium lumber products. Um, so every year in the United States, about 37 million tons of dimensional lumber from demolition, concrete form work, cutoffs from stick framing, heads into our landfills or incinerators. To put that into perspective, that's about half of what we log from our softwood forests. And in less than 60 years, all our landfills will be full here in the United States. And if you thought permitting in a building took a long time and was complex, imagine permitting a new landfill. It's 20 plus years. Uh, combine that with lumber price volatility, now is a great time to reuse lumber material because it gives you a consistent pricing and using reclaimed uh, lumber. The other reason why we want to reuse lumber is it's an incredibly strong natural resource and it embodies carbon. About one cubic meter of wood stores about one ton of CO2. And our goal is to re recycle 50% of lumber waste in the U.S. That'd be equivalent to taking about 4 million cars off the road. And so it's a massive benefit to our environment to keep it out of the incinerator, which would be an instant release of CO2, or the landfills, which is a slow release. Uh, and it's a beautiful product. It's a much higher quality product. And so we are doing this with robots. And so over the last two and a half years, we have proven out our technology. This is our system operating at a lumber yard up in American Canyon. And what we're doing is we are removing the metal fasteners. So what prohibits lumber from being reclaimed these days is the metal fasteners are too laborious to remove. And so we've developed our patented technology that automatically removes the nails, the staples, and the screws from lumber. And then once it's metal free, you can mill it, plane it, finger join it, just like you do with virgin lumber. The only difference is our material is actually higher quality than the virgin lumber you get from the store these days. Ours has tighter grain, less knots, and it's only available in buildings. And a lot of the times it's old growth material with really tight grains, really clear patterns with very few knots in it. And so this is an incredibly strong resource that we wanna make sure that we reclaim uh, for the future and not continuously put into the landfills. And so this is our system that operates full-time up in American Canyon. And we're getting ready to deliver our first one here in fourth quarter of this year to our first customer. Um, currently we are selling reclaimed lumber out of American Canyon. So if you need some for projects, we've got it available. So is there anything that's fun? Hopefully the audio is coming through for you guys. If not, it's the sound of selling nails. And this is the sound of success for us. So this is a fun video that our engineers stick in. But we're using computer vision and AI to remove the fasteners from the material. And then we use a metal detector to confirm we got it all out. I mentioned the story. The great thing about reclaiming lumber is we can track that story. The building it came out of, we can print a QR code onto that wood and so you can track the history and the story of where it came from. And this is really valuable. Architects love this because in the new structure, you can walk up to that QR code and say, hey, this column or beam or this you know, mass timber wall panel, you can see where that material came from. It could be an old build, uh, barn or mill from down the street. Um, and so it's awesome that technology enables this story tracking and telling of where the materials came from on your project. The big benefits about specifying reclaimed, as I mentioned, is it's higher quality. It consumes 90% less energy to create re reclaimed lumber than virgin. So it's this high quality product, stores carbon, much smaller footprint because you don't have to dry it. It's been drying in walls for 40, 50, 100 years, depending on where it came from. And it's a beautiful material. It's a much darker red or orange than you get with today's wood, which tend to be yellow. 
Also, you can turn it into mass timber products. You know, mass timber is one of those growing trends here. Unfortunately, most mass timber is uh, um, assembled with massive amounts of glue. And once you glue wood together, that's it. It's a one trick pony. So we've actually partnered up with a lumber mill to create thou laminated timber. So this is a wood to wood mechanical connection between the wood, and you can do this with reclaimed lumber. Uh, and so this will start production out of American Canyon uh, in Q2 of this year with the DLT available. And so this is a great way to reduce the carbon footprint of your building while introducing a beautiful product to it. And then we really encourage folks to specify deconstruction. You know, we focus on collecting material from demolition contractors, from the waste facilities. We did a three-month pilot with Zanker Green Waste down in San Jose, where we source material off their tipping floors. Uh, and we're working with four other waste facilities here in the Bay Area to source material. And we'll be starting one with City of San Francisco in the next couple months. Um, but one of the key things is if you can pass deconstruction ordinances or deconstruct your buildings, it increases the volume of material and the quality of material that can be reclaimed. You can even use it in the new building if you want. And so there's my contact information. Uh, hit us up at urbanmachine.build. Um, we are a robotics company, but we're in the wood business here, selling reclaimed lumber. And we've been selling the lumber here in the Bay Area for about a year now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, so if somebody uh, were to uh, want to purchase actually one of your uh, machines, uh, what would be the uh, order timeline for that? Yeah, so we're going to start renting the systems in fourth quarter of this year. Um, so these systems are about 100 feet long, 30 feet wide, and take about 3,000 square feet of operating room to move. So the first one will get delivered. So right now we're building up um, the rental reservations for delivery in 2025 of the systems. Excellent. And what is the, how quickly does uh, the machine uh, take the waste wood and then spit out the buildable product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it depends on what dimension of feedstock. If you're running, say, all two by fours, it generates about 2,500 board feet a day. If you're running larger feedstock, you can go up to like four by 12s, for example, it'll triple the throughput. So you could easily be generating 7,500 board feet a day. And that's just a single shift. You can always run these things one, two, or three shifts a day. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks again, Eric. We are going to go ahead and move on to our soil and greening category. And I'm going to bring Catherine from Bloom Bio up. All right, Catherine, you should be able to share your screen and video now. Excellent. Hey, can you see my screen? Looks great. I see some flamingos. <laughs> Let's see. Perfect. Um, great. Well, wonderful to meet everyone today. My name is Catherine. French, and I'm the founder of Bloom Bio. Um, Bloom Bio is a biotech company based in Berkeley, California. Um, and as a company, we develop bio-based products that remove toxic chemicals from soil and water. All of our products are based on nature's smallest most, but most powerful technology, enzymes. Um, enzymes are found everywhere. They're in your body. They help you digest your food. Um, they're in your washing detergent, helping you clean your clothes. Uh, but the enzymes we work with um, use oxygen and electrons to break down toxic chemicals, leaving nothing behind. Um, so they're great for cleaning up contaminated sites and they're to keep our customers happy and they're very good for the environment. Um, so we have a number of different products in our portfolio, but for the audience today, um, I'm highlighting three products which are um, most relevant to the um, real estate construction industry. Um, so the first is for petroleum and PAHs, um, the second is for PFAS, and the third is for um, PCBs. So in terms of how we can work together, um, our products can be used for contaminated site redevelopment. So for example, turning a brownfield site into housing um, or a school, et cetera. Um, so we can perform initial benchtop treatability studies, uh, we can also optimize application for desired results. So for example, some brownfield sites have more than one contaminant, so petroleum and PCBs. Um, we can also provide analytical reports on remediation progress, which can be um, sent to regulators. Um, and then on the flip side, for sustainable urban planning and design, um, our products really um, 
tie in well to kind of overall objectives of building kind of um, greener, more sustainable cities. Um, so for example, we can work with environmental engineers to develop more effective constructed wetlands and infiltration basins. Um, those are just two systems which are used to manage um, stormwater. Um, we can also monitor system efficacy over time. So in terms of benefits of working together, um, I think the most important things are that we can save clients time and money in terms of remediation. Because all of our work um, is done in situ, it means that we treat contaminated soil and water on site. We eliminate future liabilities. So you're not actually shipping your soil to a landfill um, and all the complications that it can rise out of that. And then of course, we're better for the environment. So for example, no harsh chemicals are used. Um, and again, you're not just creating more waste that goes to a landfill. Um, and finally, we are a team of scientists and engineers. Um, we've worked with a number of different companies from the um, oil space, chemical space, um, and we love to solve um, clients' problems. So if you have any questions, um, about our technology or the types of projects we can work on, um, please do reach out. My email address is at the bottom of the screen. Um, and thank you for your time. Great. Thanks so much, Catherine. Could you talk a little bit about uh, how deep your product uh, can be applied and then how long does it take to treat the soil with your enzyme? Yes, that's a great question. So in terms of how deep, a surface level application can go down on its own up to 18 inches in the soil. Um, we are testing injection into the soil this summer with a project partner, um, and that will actually enable you to treat um, well below 10 feet of soil. And then in terms of how long it takes, if it's a surface level contamination, like the first few inches, um, you can clean up most sites within six to 12 months. If it's feet of contamination, um, that can take longer. So, you know, um, 18 to 24 months. Great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Okay. I am going to go ahead and add our next innovator, Babylon Farms. You should now be able to share your screen. Hello. Good afternoon. Oh, just blow this up. All right, so <laughs> I think we're all set. Hi, hi there. Good afternoon. My name is Alexander Olson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Babylon Microfarms. We are a modular vertical farming company on a mission to help businesses and communities grow their own fresh, sustainable food based in Richmond, Virginia. So one of the things we noticed was that growing your own food on site is difficult. And yet there's a growing trend towards hyperlocal food and bringing farms into cities. Our goal is to leverage technology to make urban farming as accessible as possible. We do that through the gallery microfarm. So here on the right is one of our turnkey modular vertical farming systems. They require just water and electricity to grow, and we can turn any indoor space into a productive urban farm. We remotely manage these farms through our Babylon IQ software platform so that anyone can be a farmer without any prior expertise. And these units allow people to grow up to 50 different crop varieties, ranging from salad greens through to herbs, microgreens, and even flowers. The users operate them through an app and then through the remote management platform, we're able to provide support from seed to harvest. So here are some of the farms that are installed. Uh, these are modular, so they can be designed to link together to fit the space that's available or to meet the specific yield requirement. We work with clients from Aramark Compass to Dexo through the uh, retail giants like Ikea uh, to put these indoor farms into the heart of their buildings, anywhere from the, the lobby to the cafeteria. By remotely managing these farms, we're able to do preventative maintenance and analytics and ensure that they have safe and reliable harvests every time. So food safety is of paramount importance to us. So we prioritize uh, traceability throughout the supply chain. Uh, and because these are modular, we're in production now, we're able to deploy them anywhere around the world uh, with nearly 220 installs uh, in the US to date. From the user's point of view, the farms take between 30 minutes and an hour a week to operate. We They receive pre-seeded pods and consumables in the mail. They scan those into the farm with an app, and then the app is guiding them from seed to harvest. So it is a, essentially like a, a Keurig or an espresso machine for fresh vegetables. And we're empowering a new generation of uh, urban farmers who don't need any farming expertise. 
And a big part of what we do is around consumer engagement. So we're bringing people closer to their food supply chain. We're bringing the farms into the heart of cities and we're engaging people with sustainable and urban nutrition. Uh, so these farms are often installed in, in elementary schools, through universities. We do a lot of work in senior living homes where the farms are growing a reliable source of produce all year round, regardless of the weather outside. But we're also developing experiences. And so our account managers will work with the clients to develop programs um, to meet the needs of our clients. You know, and we have some clients who don't have food service operations where they're actually deploying the farms um, and reselling the produce as a revenue source or even packaging the, the produce up and delivering it to their employees as a benefit. A big part of what we do is helping uh, responsible sourcing needs for our organization. So we provide a safe and reliable platform that provides hyper-local and ESG-aligned produce. And then we provide data on all steps of the growing process for full traceability and to measure our impact. We're able to leverage that data to help uh, our clients fit different green certifications uh, from Well Building Institute through to like ACE starts in education. And this solution hits on many of the major uh, SDGs that are paramount for the sustainable cities of the future. Uh, and yeah, just to wrap things up, we, um, you know, we're really excited about San Francisco. Our home is in Richmond, Virginia on the East Coast. So we have a much larger presence here. And what we've seen that once we get a foothold in a city, there is a ripple effect and other community organizations and businesses can start to uh, grow their own produce. Um, as I mentioned, our, our main segments are kind of corporate real estate and corporate dining, uh, education from K-12 through the universities, and then healthcare uh, and senior living. And uh, yeah, so that was a quick quick overview of what we do, and I will uh, stop there for any questions. Great. Thank you, Alexander. A uh, question came in about maintenance. Can you talk a bit about what the uh, the operating maintenance looks like for your device? Yes. Yeah, so um, the user experience, they receive pre-seeded pods in the mail. They scan them into the farm. So that uh, engagement with the farm can be an hour a week, uh, or some people can do it every kind of four to six weeks and they harvest the whole farm at once. And then there is a deep clean every eight to 12 weeks where the farm is drained out. Uh, and then we provide kind of a flush uh, to maintain food safety. But all in all, it's a pretty low, um, low touch approach. And we're providing alerts every step of the way. And you know, the, the status quo right now is you'd have to build your own farm and learn hydroponics and all the science behind it. And we make sure you don't have to do any of that. Right. And how do you deliver your training to people who are learning to be ur urban farmers? Yeah. So right now we have our own installation technicians and there's kind of a limited training on site. Um, we do a lot of it virtually. So we'll basically get do an onboarding call, come up with a success plan for our clients. And then we have like really intuitive kind of step-by-step -step videos throughout the process. So whether it's training or retraining of, of your employees on site, uh, we can do that through the app or through a remote training. Excellent. And then could you tell us about the cost associated? Yes. So the standard pricing for our units is uh, $15,000 for the unit and then $395 per month for the subscription and remote management. Uh, we also do a wrapped leasing package at $699 per month uh, on a 36 month term. Uh, and I'll just add, we're actually launching a smaller product uh, at a $5,000 price point with a hundred dollar a month subscription, primarily for the K-12 market uh, and school, school senior living homes with, that are slightly more price sensitive. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Right, oh, oh, sorry. One more question. Do they provide the seeds for the plants? Yes. He uh, mentioned that he mails them to you, the seed links, correct? Yes. Uh, and yeah, I think our contact information is shared, but please reach out babylonmicrofarms.com or connect with me on LinkedIn. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks again. All right. Next up, we have Cynthia from Tarot AI. I'm bringing you up to co-host now. You should be able to share your screen, your screen now. <laughs> Great, sounds good. Looks good. Okay, you're able to see my screen? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for your time today. I know we're so close to the end, so just Hang tight. I'm really excited to share with you our groundbreaking work, making tree and infrastructure monitoring fundamentally faster and cheaper. My name is Cynthia, and I'm the founder of Taro AI. We are based here in San Francisco. And first, let me tell you about trees. 
All right. Um, San Francisco has a big tree problem. We spend over $30 million each year maintaining our trees, yet we find hundreds of them dead by their first care visit and 169 tree-related claims were filed last year after the storms. And we still have one of the smallest tree canopies of any major U.S. city at 15%, which is about half of the national average. So let me show you some more data. In the first graph, you can see that San Francisco's urban forestry budget is over $30 million each year, and the vast majority is spent on tree maintenance, and the costs are growing year over year. In the second graph, you can see that over the last 10 years, we've actually removed more trees than we've planted. This means that after spending over $300 million, we now have fewer trees than we did 10 years ago. This means wasted money, more flooding, and polluted air. Taro AI can monitor at scale, which makes tree maintenance cheaper while reducing tree removals, leading to a healthier San Francisco for everyone. All right. At Taro AI, um, we combine AI with computer vision to analyze aerial and street level imagery to automate tree monitoring and issue detection. So instead of having staff manually go out to visit over 100,000 trees like they do today, we can proactively notify the city when something is wrong so that they can take action faster to prevent damages. This is an example of all the discrepancies we found with the existing tree database. So let me show you some specific things we found. Last year, we lost a famous landmark tree at 2494 McAllister. Landmark trees are designated extra special by the city and San Francisco only has 24 of them. And so by analyzing imagery from 2022, we were already able to see early signs of canopy death, which you can see here. With better monitoring, perhaps this tree could have been saved. Let me show you another example. Here we zoom in on the circle tree in the mission. At a glance in the first photo, it might look okay. Using near infrared light, we can see that this tree is lacking chlorophyll and it's much less vibrant than the other trees in the photo. And using NDVI, an index for vegetation health, we can confirm that it's much less healthy than its neighbors. And we are just getting started. These are older screenshots and we're using even higher resolution imagery now. So imagine how we can scale this to do things like detect weakened trees and prevent them from falling over in storms or optimize watering routes. Most importantly, we can adopt these methods to infrastructure. I previously worked at Google for nearly a decade and was the lead product manager on a cool roofs project out of Google Research. My partner has extensive experience identifying cracks and potholes in roads and bridges using infrared imagery. So what are people saying so far? We've gotten really excited feedback from multiple city departments that we've spoken to. They're telling us that data is critical to their planning and management efforts, and they've been talking about this for years. And we are really excited to see how this will save costs for the city and how this might also save costs for some of you in your buildings and campuses and communities. So if you have a use case in mind for either vegetation and, or infrastructure, we would love to hear about it. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have here, or if you'd like to chat more afterwards, please reach out to me directly at my email here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, so this sounds like it's a product really intended for uh, more citywide scale. Are there any other applications that uh, with your uh, technology that you think this audience might be able to tap into and engage with? Yeah, um, this can monitor at scale, but it can also monitor very specific things like you saw um, that very particular tree on that street. And uh, a very particular campus, um, a area for a building, right, um, that you want to keep monitored, especially if there are multiple buildings. Um, we can do this without needing physical access to the location. And so um, there are a variety of use cases that we can solve. Great. And how frequently are images anticipated to be updated for this monitoring to be effective? Yeah, I think um, it's very flexible. If it's more frequently updated, um, then it's more costly, but we can expect that it's, you know, um, 
if we need it to be more recent, um, it'll cost a little more, uh, but we can expect it to be daily and the uh, low cost images are about six months old. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Cynthia. All right, our last but not least top innovator, we have Zabin Zachary. I'm going to elevate you now. Let's see, are you there, Zachary? There you are. Uh, you are muted. Sorry about that. It was uh, it had a slight delay on my end. My apologies, but we're all here. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, no. It looks really dark where I am. <laughs> Calling from the East Coast. Sorry, I'm not in the basement, I promise. Um, awesome. I'm going to share my screen here. And then I'm also going to take myself off screen just to make sure that uh, I don't have any delays here. Okay, wonderful. Um, hopefully, everyone can see it. Is that Looks That's good. True. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everyone. I'm Zach. And uh, today we're going to talk about future cities, the future of work, and the future of San Francisco and how we want to partner um, uh, and really get ourselves into the market there to make, begin making a kind of difference. Um, we're focused on decarbonizing cities, one building at a time, and uh, really reimagining what our future cities can look like, how they can interact with uh, with nature-based climate technologies, how we can create climate resilient buildings, either for new projects, developments, or large retrofits. We're also gonna just take a look at how we create healthier um, building space for us as we live our lives, as we work, as we travel. Um, so we're gonna take a look at living walls and green roofs, really the building materials at first, and then we're gonna show what we're doing more than 33 uh, buildings um, across the US. So when we think of green roofs, we're looking at it as a technology that can help absorb water storm management uh, as much as 80%. Heat island mitigation, our cities and our coastal cities are getting hotter. Um, and then uh, just by the plant's ability to absorb carbon, but ultimately what we're doing is we're integrating smart building technology to actually measure that difference. And we're gonna get to some, some really cool sophisticated things outside just plants here, um, and then energy savings. Um, so this is how these products currently play into the ecosystem. We have LEED, right, talking about how sustainable the building materials are. Then we're talking about, well, how healthy is that building in space? And then um, kind of across the pond here, uh, Bream, if you're a property owner, if you're a developer, if you're an architect designer, these are the things that we're really advocating and we're starting to understand strong ROIs tied to. So these, um, these are not uh, as much as bullet points, but something we actually explore during each project and what these are before we even start or collaborate together. So increased property value, uh, energy savings, stormwater management, uh, brand enhancement. We're seeing a lot of this, a lot of focus on how we're creating experience, particularly for commercial or for residential. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit too about carbon offsets, um, just even in terms of operation at the very end here. And we're gonna share some, uh, some I think, easy ways to collaborate and then long-term cost savings. Um, so really quickly, we're working again, property owners, architects, Fortune 500 companies, really shaping the future. These are just for affordable housing. Um, I was going to flip through these a little bit because I want to talk about the technology, but this is what we're designing uh, with Google in, in Chicago. Ah, this is uh, the Bills Tower. Um, this is completed. This is a, a rendering. It looks really great for the green roof in Chicago. And uh, again, this is a green roof. So these are just different applications. Um, looking at the technology, again, we'd like to think of it as really construction material or building materials. And so um, first, it's 100% recyclable. It's cradle to cradle. Um, it's a hydroponic mix. And we like to think of it as being building blocks. So again, uh, when you think of living walls, you can integrate it vertically. Uh, similarly, uh, with green roofs, same technology. Um, it, it just adds scale. So that was really, really important for us as a startup. How do we get this as scalable? And then ultimately, as the building blocks, the unit economics making sense for developers, for architects, for our cities. 
Um, it's 10 to 15 times more water efficient than soil-based systems because it's hydroponics. So we're, we're really conservative on the resources that the plants need to, to thrive. Um, it's 66% lighter than soil-based systems. So again, highly scalable. Um, this is super cool. Uh, because we have sensors in each of our systems and it's connected ultimately with irrigation, we have 99% plant survivability. So we wanna make sure that it's looking healthy, it's looking well, um, and ultimately if we're not replacing plants, it's allowing them to continue as they mature, uh, uh, quite literally decades, uh, to continue to absorb carbon. Okay, this is when we get into uh, more of the architecture, uh, design, engineering phase is before uh, we do a large project, let's just use a green roof, for example, what we'll do is data software visualization. So we'll actually understand the water storm management, the energy savings, um, and even tying that to across properties that we're doing with JLL. And what's it ultimately mean for my properties? What are we saving for energy? How is this uh, basically um, could contribute to an ROI? And, um, um, and understanding the, the true measures of, of our carbon uh, offsets and, and really an avoidance to some degrees. And then we're gonna kind of shift here a little bit uh, on the future work. So we have this technology, we really started it off with how do, we, um, how do we create better work experiences? And so this, uh, this began in kind of the, the, the fever of, of COVID of uh, us all being inside and saying, hey, this is maybe a chance where we can pause and think that there is this connection to nature as we think through larger projects, uh, as larger developments, um, how can we scale this? And ultimately we wanted to do that in a way that allowed architects, designers, companies be familiar with the technology and have it integrated in, in, in their space that was seamless. So we created a turnkey product um, there's no construction, there's no uh, drainage or, or uh, connection to irrigation needed. It's all self-circulating. Um, all of our products, green roof, living walls, or the Model Z comes with 100% plant guarantees. So that's really important. And then what we do to maintenance these is we, we hire individuals in each of our markets, uh, Zobin technicians, where you get a dedicated Zobin technician that's also going to make sure to, uh, to care after this product. So it's, it's really important for us. Um, and then we're just seeing this different use cases of, of adding uh, multiple Model Zs into a space to create something really immersive. Um, this is what we've done with Rice University. We love doing this with really anyone that uses the products, whether it's a designer or it's in your space, is doing tenant and employee wellness research. For us, we have a really strong baseline. We know that plants make us more productive. It quite literally uh, 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 lowers our stress levels. Um, more, more creative, we're more collaborative in spaces such as conference rooms. And uh, so what we like to do is after an install, after a project together or a joint project together is conduct these uh, wellness surveys essentially. Um, for us, it's a win-win. We, we, we have an idea of what, what the metrics are going to show, but it really starts to, to point to, again, that ROI from a human performance level and health level. And then this is just plants. So this is the one hotel in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, we just do also interior plantscaping. I'm going to share what we're doing on a climate twist because that's really important. Is um, what we found when we're doing these really big projects and we started to work with all these uh, partners in the industry was ultimately having you know 1.2 million landscaping vans across the US to just water your plants. It's not good for the environment, right? Like it's, it, felt, it felt really dirty to us. So we thought, well, what if we eliminated the need to have landscaping vans and we created smart planners that ultimately is run through a tech enabled platform that connects with your dedicated Zobin technician. And that technician is in that area. They're, they're quite literally neighbors to that, that building. Um, so they're not, using, uh, they're, they're not using vans, they're using public transit, biking, um, et cetera. And so if we do that, then we start to avoid over 24 million metric tons of carbon footprint that are just coming into water plants. And then how we're incentivizing this from an ESG lens, maybe it's a, someone in um, real estate 
is we're offsetting, uh, or really, excuse me, eliminating 75% of the carbon footprint for that building. And then what we'll do is if they work with an existing vendor, we'll guarantee 25% on your plant care operations. So how do we reduce by 75% your carbon footprint? And then how we, we incentivize ultimately with your um, cost savings on your ops. Um, so what we're doing now and what we're offering is if you have a client, if you have a property, maybe it's a many space, it could be even a conference room. It could also be just your office. We're, um, we're doing uh, plant giveaways up to six plants, large premium plants into that space uh, for free when you opt into our plant care subscription. So our goal is we wanna be in 50 properties in San Francisco. We wanna hire 10 technicians this year and we want to avoid uh, 25,000 uh, metric tons of carbon uh, operations just on the plantscaping. And we want to really, really roll our sleeves together to think how do we redesign, retrofit our buildings in San Francisco. Uh, and that's Great. all, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Zachary. Uh, that was a very thorough presentation. Um, thanks for joining us. And I'm gonna pass this back on to Emily. Great. All right. That concludes all of our innovator presentations. Thank you so much to the innovators for being so patient and um, giving such great thorough overviews of your products. And thank you to all the attendees for bearing with us um, and, and staying here to the end and, and for such engaging questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and review some of the ways that you can get involved with the larger YesSF movement. Um, but while I'm doing that, please do feel free to drop any general questions into the Q&A, um, either for the innovators that um, Sharon and myself can relay to them or about general um, the general YSSF um, movement. So if you did see an innovator that you uh, are interested in connecting with, you found their product interesting for your company or someone in your network, um, please do see myself and Sharon's email um, in that slide there. We're also gonna drop them in the chat and we can get you connected to those innovators. Um, if you felt inspired and, and maybe uh, your company might not benefit from their product, but someone in your network um, might, uh, please do watch out for, again, that booklet of the overview of the innovators. We'll provide this recording. So just keep them top of mind because um, they are making such a difference um, in our community and, and hopefully the world. Um, and then on a larger level, Yes SF is... Uh, we're focused on helping these innovators deploy in San Francisco, but we're also trying to tie this to the revitalization movement that's happening in San Francisco. So I'm very excited to share that the Chamber of Commerce, uh, we are actually opening up a brick and mortar physical headquarter for YesSF. So that'll be downtown. Uh, we'll, we're aiming to launch in, in summer. Um, so hopefully events like these will be held in that space and we can see you all in person. If you're interested, if your company might be interested in getting engaged in the uh, headquarters and, and what that space really means. Um, there is um, going to be co-working space, um, a regular activation with a coffee shop, um, but also this, um, we will have an events and community focused space um, where we're looking for partners um, for programming, um, but also if your company is interested in helping us create kind of this future vision for YesSF in San Francisco, um, we are uh, recruiting for an advisory board. And if that's of interest, please do let me know. Um, and there are also, as, as Sharon mentioned, some really exciting ways to get involved on a global level as well through Uplink. So if you have any general questions, um, please do email myself and Sharon and we'll be sure to get back to you quickly. So with that, I'll pass to Sharon if you have any closing words. Um, otherwise, that's that's all we have. Yes, thank you all for staying till the very end. And thank you for our innovators for also joining us. Uh, just on the note of uh, global opportunities, um, this pilot project that uh, Uplink in the World Economic Forum did with the YesSF uh, Urban Sustainability Challenge is actually an effort that we are growing in other cities. Uh, if you are a national or international firm uh, who's interested in this work, uh, please do reach out to me and I'd be happy to let you know uh, where else we are looking at deploying the, uh, these innovation challenges. So thank you again for your time. Thank you for uh, Emily and uh, Jackson on the Chamber side for hosting us today. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you. Bye, folks.